Hello, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful session about resilience mechanisms. Let's see how resilient you are. So let me introduce uh, myself. I'm Volker Grimm from the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig. And I'm organizing this together with Hannah Weise from the Freie Universität in Berlin. And we had this funny case when we prepared this session that we sent invitations to about eight people, hoping that maybe one or two will say yes. And then everybody said yes. So there was no slot, uh, slot uh, left for us, so we didn't have any time slot for us. But anyway, let's just start with our first speaker, our keynote speaker, Tom Oliver. He has time slots, two time slots, 30 minutes. Looking forward. Thanks, Volker. <coughs> so, hello. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk today about uh, quantifying the mechanisms underpinning resilient ecosystem functions. So, uh, Spaceship Earth, uh, imagine it's 2050. Uh, you are an elite Earth steward uh, working closely with many others around the world to monitor and manage the biosphere. Um, international governments uh, recognize the, the crucial importance of long-term sustainability uh, and uh, fund a, whole, a small army of field ecologists, engineers, and technicians to gather the data that you analyze. Uh, they, they obviously uh, put into place international uh, policies rapidly so we can uh, mitigate environmental impacts and navigate Spaceship Earth on a sustainable course. Or maybe not. Uh, who knows whether we'll be uh, there by 2050. But I guess what I want to talk about today is the instrumentation on this uh, panel uh, of Spaceship Earth and what it might look like. So what data do we have? Um, in the UK, we're, we're uh, fortunate to have lots of uh, data. It's actually not... Um, really so strongly funded by the state, but more reliant on the goodwill of a whole range of volunteer organizations and charities who've done an amazing job to pull it together, for example, into this state of nature report. Similar uh, environmental data sets can be harnessed to uh, map ecosystem services. So for example, this is the EcoMap software. It takes point uh, measurements of proxies of ecosystem services, combines them with a range of different environmental layers, and using a statistical correlative model approach can extrapolate to produce these maps of ecosystem services. Or you could use process-based uh, models, such as uh, the INVEST modeling framework has some of these. And my colleague John Redhead has used this to uh, validate models of water yields. So this is, takes as input information uh, layers of precipitation, land cover, soil. Um, and then it predicts uh, the amount of water flowing through a catchment, so the water yield. So this is relevant to services such as hydropower production, but it also feeds into other service models such as water quality. And in the UK, we've also got good data on the measurements of water yield in certain catchments. So here this is the measured yield of water flowing through a catchment versus the predicted. So you can see this is a really impressive validation in this case, R squared about 0.97. Uh, showing that in this case you can really use this process-based model to estimate ecosystem services. But of course, as I mentioned, the UK is, is blessed with quite good data sets. Um, if we want global indicators, uh, we, many countries are much more data sparse and we have to essentially come down to the lowest common denominator in terms of quite simplified, um, for example, essential biodiversity variables, capturing information on species populations and traits, uh, ecosystem functions such as net primary productivity. Uh, and also there's been attempts, this latest paper by Shepard just uh, this week, looking at uh, global indicators of eco the state of ecosystem services, so fish stocks, um, forest extent, red list indicator for pollinators. So really um, trying to get a handle on the state of biodiversity and ecosystem services. But um, of course, if we're trying to chart a, a sustainable course for Spaceship Earth, there's a lot of constraints. You know, we have global cooperation, but no global governance, really. In fact, things seem to be going the other way. Um, and also, there's huge uh, constraints on environmental funding. And it doesn't help with people like this, obviously, in charge. Um, but I want to put those constraints aside, really. Um, they're political, social issues. But ask about the scientific questions. Uh, do we have the vision correct in terms of the information we're trying to gather to, to steer um, a sustainable course for the biosphere? So I'm going to ask, uh, are indicators of the state of biodiversity and ecosystem services sufficient? So in terms of thinking about environmental indicators, this uh, 
D DIPSI or DPSIR framework is quite useful. You have these ultimate drivers which create pressures and then they have some impact on the state of the environment such as uh, biodiversity here. And then a loss of biodiversity leads to uh, loss of ecosystem services, reduced human well-being. And then we can put into play responses which either um, tackle the drivers at the source or maybe they just mitigate the impacts of those drivers on the state. But the problem with following this cycle in real time is that by the time we've got these conservation policies uh, in response, you know, they may require regulation, development of regulation or incentive schemes. We then have to put in place the ecological restoration. I mean, how long does that take? Maybe years, decades? So if you're following this cycle in real time, you're actually suffering substantial losses of human well-being whilst you're waiting for these um, re reactive policies to come into place. So it'd be much better to have a proactive management um, response. So the analogy here is, for example, in monitoring a bridge, we don't just monitor whether the bridge is standing, 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 and then, oh, the bridge has collapsed, now let's try and fix it. We don't just monitor the state of the bridge, we monitor, um, well, engineers monitor the, the damage occurring to a bridge. They go and examine the mortar, cracks appearing in the brickwork, and that's an indicator of the risk of the collapse of the bridge. When that indicator reaches a certain level, they put in, in response repair actions, so the, the state of the bridge remains unchanged. So uh, taking this, extending it to an ecological example, this is maybe some, eco maybe some ecosystem function like pollen delivery to crops. It might have this rapid non-linear change. If we notice that at point B and put into place uh, policies, we might not be able to have them effective before we s suffer this substantial decline. Whereas the green line is potentially some indicator of the resilience of the pollination function. And there we could put into place uh, proactive actions at an earlier level. So this is all very uh, abstract, I realise. So just thinking about a real-world example, um, the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme has been collecting data on the abundance of butterflies since about 1976. In 1976, there was a huge drought event in the UK. Uh, it's always been a bugbear that we couldn't really examine the impacts just using those abundance monitoring data. But more recent methods, um, so led by colleagues at CEH, Nick Isaac, Gary Powney, have um, allowed us to develop this uh, indicator of... Um, an annual indicator of, of occurrence of the butterflies. So we can validate that against the monitoring data where, we have, where they two overlap and show it's a good fit. But sh this indicator allows us to go back an extra five years and it does appear, what's shown here is aggregated trends for habitat specialist butterflies and what's called wider countryside species. But we've done this for every individual species and it does appear that there is this large uh, crash in 1976 and the means before and the means after the, the crash seem to be different. Um, so this suggests there was some kind of tipping point for butterflies. And over the whole 40-year period after this, it, what, you know, even the, all the actions that have been put in place, agro-environment schemes, um, you know, to the tune of 400 million per year, have not managed to reverse this decline. But maybe it's because, the, well, the, the damage to butterflies has probably occurred long before this 76 drought. You know, following the war, 1950s, there was a huge period of agricultural intensification conversion of natural habitats and loss of these species habitats, even if it only wasn't until uh, some extreme weather event where the, the, the change in state was realised. So maybe we need indicators of risk. Uh, Volker himself produced this paper in 1997, uh, identifying there was a whole lot of uh, terminology around risk with terms such as stability, persistence, constancy, resilience, resistance, inertia. Um, this is a word cloud of, of Volker's paper, um, so essentially he looked at stability concepts in the ecological literature, found there's lots of confusion in the terminology. So you don't need to read the paper now. You can do this with any paper you want if you want to read it quickly. <laughs> no, it doesn't always work. Um, but so uh, this, this was Volker's analysis and, and realising that actually a lot of these terms are, are very related with each other and they can be termed under the umbrella of stability. More recently, people are using an umbrella term of resilience, and it comes more from this uh, systems, um, this ecological resilience literature. Um, but actually, I would say, or we have said in this, this short paper, that, that these two uh, sets of terminology, these two umbrella terms, have a lot of synergies, and actually they're very much about the same thing. And they're starting to converge. So traditionally, stability has uh, been used in the ecosystem function research. But though that research field is, um, the studies are being carried out increasingly larger spatial scales at larger temporal scales, starting to look, to look at multiple ecosystem functions and even starting to think about ecosystem services. So it's starting to move towards the more holistic side. And ecological resilience literature, dare I say it, which has been a bit um, hand wavy, is starting to become a bit more precise and starting to quantify these, uh, these indicators. 
So I think the two terms are moving together. I'm going to talk about resilience today. And the definitions um, have a quite a history, but there's two broad definitions. One focus on the ability of a system to absorb disturbances while retaining the same basic structure or ways of functioning, which I'll call resistance as a shorthand. And this definition by PIM about the ability of a system to return to a predisturbed state. So this is called engineering resilience or, or recovery, simply. Lots of studies showing that uh, ecological systems can kind of flip states uh, from a more pristine state into a more degraded state with a lower, um, lower delivery of ecosystem services. And it can be very uh, difficult and costly, if not impossible, to, uh, to push the system back into the more pristine state. But when we're trying to measure resilience as an indicator, what should we be actually measuring? If you look at the definitions, Holling talks about measuring uh, or retaining the same basic structure and ways of functioning. Well, the two are actually slightly different. It's a bit of amb ambiguity there. Pym talks about a predisturbed state. So some authors have talked about uh, using species composition in terms of trying to assess where a state is. I th just to, to highlight a, a word of warning, I think, in terms of using species composition, is that in some cases, ecological communities may need to be dynamic to maintain stability in those ecosystem functions. So a nice example is this community temperature index. Uh, this paper by Vincent de Victor shows that the community temperature index, this is essentially the balance of warm and cold associated species in a community. It's increasing over time in birds and butterflies across Europe, as you see here. And um, they, they see that as evidence that a species are tracking climate change. Um, if you think about this in an ecosystem service perspective, you know, if you're losing cold associated pollinators, you need the warm associated pollinators to come in, and that is that community dynamism which allows your pollination function to be maintained. So I would argue that we don't really want resilience of species composition necessarily. We want to really focus on the resilience of ecosystem functions that those communities deliver. So with a whole range of co-authors from a, a working group which I'll mention, uh, we came up with this definition, which brings together the two aspects of resistance and recovery. The ability of a function to resist or recover, re recover rapidly from perturbations, thereby maintaining function above an acceptable level. So you can have a system which is the function here, shown by this symbol, is quite resistant to perturbations. This one is less resistant but can recover rapidly. And this one shows low resilience in terms of resistance and recovery and has these large deficits of ecological function, which are obviously costly to society. So the working group that I mentioned was this NERC-funded working group, and it was aiming to identify the factors that underpin resilient ecosystem functions provided by species. And we wanted to assess you know, whether we could take those forward as indicators. Do we have data, or could we conceivably gather data um, to, for those, use as those indicators? So this is the, the overall outcome, really. Um, this set of uh, mechanisms uh, gathered from the literature uh, and we've collated them at the species level, the community level, and the landscape level. And I'm not going to go into them all in, in detail, obviously, but just to kind of give you a flavour of what they are. So at the species level, things like sensitivity to environmental change. This is the idea, if there's a species which is particularly important for an ecosystem function, obviously if that species is sensitive to a, a type of environmental perturbation, then your ecosystem function will also likely have higher risk and lower resilience. At the community level, this correlation between response and effect traits. Well, these effect traits are um, the, the traits that mediate species um, ecosystem functions. And response traits are how species respond to an environmental perturbation. So if the two are correlated, then any given environmental perturbation will knock out a lot of the, the species that carry out the same function. And so it's a higher uh, risk of collapse. And then there's mechanisms at the um, landscape level, so environmental heterogeneity. This is diversity in habitats or topography. Uh, in a, on the one hand, this increases species richness, which means you've got a range of species with, that carry out the same ecosystem function. But also, even with the same set of species, if you have a more diverse uh, local environment, then that provides a range of microclimates and a range of resources that kind of allow populations to weather the storm of these perturbations. So I'm not going to go through all the, these in detail, as I said, but the aim of the working group was to was to move on from these and to identify indicators or potential indicators. So um, we've been trying to take forward some of these. One of them is this butterfly genetics monitoring scheme. And the idea here is that we measure genetic variability. So in terms of resilience, uh, having a, a range of genotypes in the population means you're more likely to have a genotype which is tolerant or can recover from some kind of perturbation. Um, also, with regards to the, um, the big sort of Convention for Biological Diversity targets, their Aichi targets, number 13 is to safeguard 
genetic diversity? Well, we can't even measure it at the moment beyond uh, domesticated animals. That's the only indicator there is. So the target really is that we can measure this across multiple sites and over time. So I'm not going to go into it in much more detail. There's a website uh, you can have a look at. I'm not trying to promote or sell it in any way, um, but there are mugs, and I'll be selling, <laughs> selling them at the front after the session. No, I'm only joking. But uh, uh, this just makes the point about the kind of lack of funding for environmental science. You know, this addresses, I think, one of the IHE targets that we're, is not being addressed at all. And yet there's very little funding available through, you know, DEFRA or JNCC or, or state to to do this kind of monitoring. So it's really been done on the kind of uh, free will of, of European collaborators sending in samples. So essentially we've got sites from the, the UK and, and also European collaborators. So they don't get anything except a free mug. Um, moving quickly on, um, at the, an example at the community level is this idea of functional redundancy. So if, if this is a species which carry out much the same function and if you lose one species then maybe another can step in to take its place. So to give a, a bit more of an example of this, uh, we carried out this analysis of, of the biodiversity in, in the UK, for which we have data for. So about four, uh, four and a half, almost 4,500 species across all these different groups. So bees, birds, centipedes, crane flies, harvestmen, hoverflies. Um, so this is distribution records that we can analyse, controlling for recorder effort to produce a trend for each species over time. And those trends are grouped by these different ecosystem functions that the species provide. So whether they're pollinators or they control pests or they decompose waste. And what we looked at is the balance of species that show significant uh, declines in red or significant increases. And for certain ecosystem functions, uh, namely ones that provide pollination or pest control or cultural values provided by animals only, um, as opposed to plants and animals together, these groups showed uh, where the declines really outweighed the increases. And then from there, this is the figure you saw before, but we did this additional analysis saying, OK, we've got these native declines in many groups, but maybe is there any possibility that new species coming in from, um, from the continent could in any way offset those declines? And it's just really a, uh, an assessment of the numbers. Essentially, there's lots of plants that have come into the country, but in terms of new animals for pollination pest control, there's no way that those new arrivals since 1970 could offset the, the losses in resident species. But what we're not saying here is that in the UK over the last 40 years, there's been a, a decline in pollination services. What we're, we're not saying that the crops are, are lower yields now. We're saying that there's been an erosion of the species richness that perform those functions. So there's an increased fragility or, or a reduce, reduction in resilience of those ecosystem functions and services. Um, there's a lot, obviously a lot more work to do here. We characterise these at broad levels, but you could think about pollination of individual crops and think about functional redundancy at that level. We've also taken further another approach at looking at network interaction structure. So this is the idea that the way species uh, interactions are organised can make certain uh, communities more re uh, robust or resilient to some kind of perturbation. So uh, those studies obviously really, you know, hugely work intensive to go to a site and sample all the different species you find there. So we're kind of trialling a different approach where you use citizen science data to look at these national networks, uh, visitation networks between plants and pollinators, and ask whether we can use that national network topology to infer a network locally based on a list of species that we've got. So, um, and then obviously then try to uh, infer the resilience from those networks. So obviously this is a bit of an early stage, but this is a potential for another indicator that can be repeated across lots of sites, every 10 kilometres square in the country, for instance, and, and repeated over time. So the last examples really I want to give uh, relate to this landscape level. And <clears throat> two examples here is the, um, the extent and the configuration of, of natural habitats affecting the resilience of populations. So the example here, this is the ringlet butterfly. Uh, it's a woodland edge species. It doesn't like drought, so you get these population crashes. Um, so what we've done is for each site, you can look at the extent of this population crash. So that's shown on this here, the abundance change following a drought in 1995. And most points are below the line, so the most populations crashed in England. But the crashes were particularly severe where there was less woodland in the, in the local landscape. Similarly, the recovery, if you take this slope coefficient and plot it, the recovery rate is affected by the, the configuration of the woodland. Where the woodland is fragmented into lots of patches, the recovery rates tend to be lower or negative. So um, you, you might say, actually, well, most of the recovery rates are positive anyway, so they're going to recover. So why does it really matter? In the long term, they're, they're kind of resilient. But obviously, um, it matters if those drought events become more frequent. So we extended this work by taking a forward look, working with climate scientists at, at CH, 
to uh, look at the frequency of these aridity, uh, annual uh, aridity scores. And so I look at the frequency of years, which is a dashed line here, in which the aridity is equal or more arid than 1995. So the aridity index just combines temperature and rainfall. And you can see under these different emission scenarios, from the red being the most severe to the blue, that that changes. It's probably more enlightening to look at the kind of raw output. So there were 17 global circulation models that were used in the latest IPCC report. And these are the annual values from those. You can see, even under the most benign scenario, scenario there's a huge number of years which may be much more arid than 1995. And under the, the emissions scenario 8.5, which is actually the one we're currently on track for, which is quite frightening, um, you know, by mid-century, every year predicted to become much more arid than 1995. And of course, we want to ask, okay, as those droughts increase in frequency, so if we take a moving window and assess the frequency of droughts, how, how would that affect the uh, butterflies? And really, from uh, the butterfly uh, data, we can get the sensitivity and the recovery, as I mentioned. So you can get an expected recovery time. And you can ask, if the recovery time is less than the return time of the drought, then that's not so bad. But if the return time of the drought falls below the recovery time of the butterflies, you can imagine the populations start to erode and, um, and, and, that, and the population is likely to go extinct. So here's the overall result. Lots of information that I can't really go into too much detail. But just to highlight, we looked at six drought-sensitive butterfly species. We captured the uncertainty in our outputs in terms of the probability of population persistence. So this is the proportion of global circulation models in which the recovery time is still less than the return time of the drought. But as your moving window moves forward, that decreases. Under the most benign emission scenario, you can see the persistence is about 60%. That's because we're already locked into increases in drought events. But if you go on the high emission scenario, that tails off real rapidly. Uh, and obviously it changes depending on the landscape scenario as well. This is the amount of semi-natural habitat, whether we have lots of natural habitat or less, and whether it's fragmented or not fragmented. And obviously the probability of persistence declines uh, correspondingly. So the overall take-home message from this work is we need to do both. We need to manage our landscapes better and, we, and mitigate CO2 emissions. But for this particular talk, the, the message is really that we can use these indicators of the extent and configuration of natural habitat to inform on the risk faced by populations uh, under environmental perturbations. And if we had these kind of indicators, imagine if we had these indicators every year from 1950, we'd have seen this gradual uh, decline in the level of uh, in resilience. And maybe that would have prompted policymakers to take proactive action. Of course, then you've got to convince them that that, to do that, uh, which is another difficulty. But that, that would have shown a gradual decline rather than this, this nonlinear change in state. So to summarize, really, um, I've stated that uh, indicators of an ecosystem state are not really sufficient. We need indicators of resilience as well. There's obviously, uh, and that's particularly the case if we have these nonlinear changes in the, in the state, and also if our, if our environmental policies take time to, to come into effect, then this is particularly important to have these indicators of resilience. There's lots more to do. I've talked to, in the latter half about population resilience, but of course the functions are delivered by the species themselves, uh, sorry, the communities. So we need to think about how those populations combine into communities. Um, I've talked about lots of possible indicators, genetic diversity, functional redundancy, uh, networks, functional connectivity. Do we present those as separate indicators or do we aggregate them together to convey the message about resilience? And in terms of conveying messages, I think we really do need to work across disciplines, work with economists and other social scientists to really think about how we communicate those levels of risk. And just really my last slide is to this, uh, talk about this planetary boundaries uh, concept. This has been a really powerful concept in terms of conveying levels of risk. The idea is that um, there are these planetary safe limits, and if we keep degrading the environment, we may cross these thresholds, in which case the risk of a, of a catastrophic uh, loss of ecosystem service increases rapidly. And um, this has been really powerful, but of course there's huge amounts of uncertainty. We don't know whether there's a single planetary safe limit or whether it, it, they're regional. We don't know whether biodiversity has a single safe limit or maybe there are different safe limits for different ecosystem services provided by biodiversity. It's also time dependent. If you're thinking about 100 years rather than 50 years, you're more likely to have a large environmental perturbation. So you need higher levels of biodiversity to, make, to suppress risks to the same level. So there's a lot of, of nuances here and a lot of uncertainty. And I think we really need to, to, to work better and work more at quantifying that uncertainty. Um, 
to give an analogy with the climate science, it's only when climate scientists kind of got together with economists and really started to quantify what the impacts to livelihood and health could be from climate change before policies were really started to be put into place. And with the, the biodiversity 2020 targets, there's been a, a kind of woeful you know, lack of policy progress towards uh, meeting those targets by 2020. And I think, in part, this is to do with the uncertainty. And, you know, we can convey the total value of ecosystem services, but I think we need, we start, need to think more about conveying the, the marginal um, values associated with, with different policy options. And maybe then, of course, we, we can use those indicators of risk to uh, populate our instrumentation controls and uh, steer... Uh, a sustainable course for Spaceship Earth. So uh, thank you for listening. Thanks for Volker and Hannah for inviting me. And of course, thanks to lots of co-authors whose work I've presented here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We have time for questions. But please, if you have a question, wait until you have the microphone because the session is recorded. I thought I'd got off lightly there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe I did get off lightly. <laughs> Yeah, so, so it's a good point. So the question was about the, the changes in different ecosystem functions, uh, declines in species versus increases. And yeah, there's a definite pattern where if you have more data, you're more likely to get significance. So there's more blue and more red for, for groups or for ecosystem functions for which the groups have more data. But that's why we, the test was an, an odds ratio test. And it's essentially asking whether the, yeah, the amount of red um, is different to the amount of blue. And although there's not huge amounts of differences, because the sample sizes are quite large, you know, there's, there's a 4,500 species in total, there were differences. And in the, in the paper, there is a plot showing the odds ratios. And you can see, so for pollination, pest control, and the cultural values provided by animals, that there is this, this um, imbalance where the declines outweigh the in increases. I and mean, actually, even if they didn't, even if they were equal, you could probably make arguments that that is showing really a sort of homogenization of biodiversity because the increasing species are spreading out across the country and the, you're getting declines in a lot of the specialists. And so actually that could still mean local reductions in biodiversity, but we we're a bit careful about making those kind of inferences. But it was a lot easier to, when, when the, there were differences in, uh, and the declines did outweigh the increases. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Oh. Um, please wait for the microphone. It's working now. Um, so this might be a bit of a tangential question to the talk. So it seems to me that the argument of um, preserving the ecosystem is still centered around the ecological services that they provide for the humans. But I think the great danger there is that, especially with like Trump administration and things like that, because it's a subjective judgment. So um, if you're preserving the ecosystem for the sake of the, um, the services that they provide to us, depending on how you determine that which ones are valuable for humans, then you decide on your conservation priorities. So what do you think about the uh, idea of actually shifting our perspectives from preserving, preserving the ecosystem for the sake of ecosystem services to purely preserving for the intrinsic values that the ecosystems have? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think um, 
So this, this kind of utilitarian approach, uh, of course, you know, makes a lot of assumptions. But I think, uh, you know, it, there is the science there in linking these changes in, in the environment to, to human well-being, even though you have to kind of measure well-being in, in different ways and it's not something you can easily get at. Um, but I think there is, of course, a case for preservation, for preservation's sake, sort of moral argument in, in a way. Um, there's a danger. So the initial, I guess, the ecosystem services paradigm, I'm going to cover this in a, in a one-minute question, was about preserving species which provide ecosystem services now. Uh, but I think what I'm trying to say is we need to move beyond that and think about the species that can provide ecosystem services that are resilient in the future. So rather than just the 2% of pollinators that provide 80% of pollination service from the Klein paper, you may need to conserve more pollinators. But of course, actually, not all insects do pollination. and There's a whole lot of things we don't really know what they do. And you could, I think there, there is a certain case where, you know, only even the resilience for ecosystem services argument goes so far. And if we want to conserve all biodiversity, we need to go back to these moral arguments. But then almost we're back to square one, which is where conservation was in, you know, the, the 60s. And so we need to rethink that we don't make the same mistakes where people just ignore us completely because we're not expressing utilitarian, you know, the values to people and the importance to people. So, yeah, not really an adequate answer, but uh, we need, I think we need a whole symposium on that question. Great pleasure to be in, in Liverpool. The last time I was on the Albert Dock was in a yellow Dutch Marine. I don't know whether you've tried those, but they're, uh, they're a wonderful way of experiencing Liverpool. Uh, that's, that's not actually my talk, but I could try and give it if you like. Um, can I have my slides, <laughs> please? <laughs> uh, or maybe I'll just use these. I'll, I'll just improvise with these. Uh, and basically, what, we, what we've tried to do in, in our research is to uh, uh, measure resilience and um, building on uh, from what we've just been hearing. Um, uh, it's been a real learning process, this. And uh, one of the things we've learned is we, we've actually been working in a terrestrial ecosystem. And one of the things we learned was that um, uh, we should have worked on lakes, like we've just been hearing. And uh, we should have been out measuring these lakes every, every, twice a week, which is uh, you know, to build up the data set. Uh, in terrestrial ecosystems, those kind of data are really rare. So, um, but we have got a mixture of long-term data, which we've uh, been able to analyze, uh, together with some gradient analysis and some modeling. So I'm going to talk about um, the three of those. You can knock on the window, Volker, and wake up our projectionist. <laughs> Wrong talk. Can you hear me in the room at the back? <laughs> uh, tell some jokes. Okay. Uh. <laughs> well, that's sort of progress. Do you want me to come up there and have a look? It's a PDF. Maybe that screwed your whole system. Yes, we're there. Great. Thank you very much. So. I hope it was worth the wait after all that. Um, so, yeah, so we tried to do this in, in a temperate system. So, very quickly, I'm just going to talk about how we've approached this and uh, the results that we've got. Oops. Hopefully. This is just not fair, is it? There we go. Oh. Right, so uh, as we've been hearing this, uh, this um, when we started this a, f a few years ago, we knew nothing about resilience, really. And we thought, oh, this will be a breeze, you know, we'll just um, plow through and we'll measure this thing called resilience. But of course, this just timed, we just timed it to perfection because there's this huge burst of uh, publications arguing about what resilience is and how to measure it. And of course, that surge of interest is still ongoing. 
And uh, if you look at the literature, as we've already heard, there's all sorts of diagrams in there. I do love these ones with little marbles rolling around landscapes. So there's just a little random selection of those there. And some of these give you little indications of how you might measure resilience if you uh, can detect these multiple stable states that we've been hearing about. So we got very excited about all that. I thought, well, let's give this a go. Uh, and then, um, then we read this book, which is a big mistake. Uh, I, I don't encourage you to read books. It's a big mistake. And uh, this is one by Peter Petritus, and it's about uh, multiple stable states, who basically says everybody's got it wrong. And um, you know, all of these ideas are underpinned by a theory that's basically being misapplied, uh, particularly because of this. The, the theory really is about pulse perturbations, and uh, when people actually study these things in nature, what they mostly study is actually uh, ongoing uh, pressures rather than pulse perturbations. So we got very worried about that, having thought, oh yeah, well, let's do this. Uh, we thought, um, uh, oh dear, maybe we shouldn't uh, do it this way and, and not try and measure ecological resilience, which as we've already been hearing is very difficult anyway. So what did we do? Well, there's only one thing to do. We invited Volker and Hannah over to uh, a workshop, which we hosted uh, uh, last year uh, with the BS, and to tell us how to do it properly. And um, Volker came up with a lovely little suggestion, uh, which, I'll, uh, which we've applied. So this is the results of applying what you suggested. And uh, I thought you'd like to hear it, Volker. So, um, and what we did, this is a, a best project that we focused on the, uh, the New Forest, which is a national park in, in southern England. And we've really much focused on the wooded component of that. And as I was saying earlier, we've got these three elements, the long-term data, gradient analysis, and uh, spatial modeling. And, uh, and what we've tried to do is look at ecosystem functions and uh, services, as well as biodiversity, at the landscape scale. So we really went for it. And uh, the three components that we've analysed are these, and this will be familiar to a lot of you, but uh, the idea is what, you know, what Volker suggested was we should try and measure resistance, which is, if you like, the, uh, the amount of uh, shift in the trajectory of change following a disturbance event, the rate of recovery, and then persistence, which is some measure of similarity. So we've tried to do that. Now, the long-term data go back to uh, these permanent transects that were established in the 50s. So we've got a, uh, six years' worth of data. And just by, ch by chance, by luck, if you like, what's happened since these transects were put in is a lot of the woodland has died back. We think because of uh, climate change, probably. But you see a lot of dead beech trees in here in particular. And the conversion into, in some areas, are now completely grassland. So we thought, oh, this is exciting. It's, uh, it could be a regime shift. Uh, how, how naive we were. But anyway, uh, that's what we thought. And uh, what we were able to do there was to measure stuff. And uh, to show, so this is trajectories in basal area for each of the subplots along these transects. And you can see some pretty dramatic shifts going on in at least part of the transect. Not everywhere, but in parts of it, uh, the forest really died back, sometimes very rapidly. So this is our equivalent to those wonderful lake data we just heard about. This is the best we could do. Well, it's possible, if you analyze these data, to show some quite exciting thresholds. Uh, this is in relation to um, uh, the, c the cover of grass. So as, you, as the stand dies back, the ground floor shifts in a non-linear way to grass cover, and there's other various non-linear relationships we found. So again, we thought, oh, great, thresholds, we could use these to uh, measure ecological resilience, but then we read this book and gave up hope of ever doing that. Um, but anyway, what we do have uh, in this landscape is not just one site that's died back, but lots of sites. So I was very mean to Paul, the PhD student who had to do this work. So not just 10 replicates, let's do 12 for no reason apart from, you know, I don't know, being sadistic, I think. But anyway, so uh, he, he very bravely went and did lots of uh, gradients. And uh, what he was able to do within each of those sites is choose sites along this gradient of dieback and then go and measure a load of things, including various measures of biodiversity. Uh, you've got fungi here and, and lichens and plants, and then to see what happens along these gradients. So he was able to show some quite nice things. So he's got some evidence of a, a non-linear relationship for, to mycorrhizal diversity, and similarly for lichens here. Uh, beetles, though, do completely the other thing, as do plants. So as the woodland um, falls, di dies back, uh, some elements of biodiversity actually do re very well out of that, as you might expect. Uh, he also measured a load of uh, soil properties and uh, soil respiration things, and again, uh, a variety of different uh, responses there. Um, so what we did then was to try and scale up from these sites to the whole landscape level using this uh, modelling. This is uh, my colleague Elena Cantarello led on this element. So this is a, a, a spatially explicit model uh, which has now been linked with Century, which simulates uh, nitrogen carbon dynamics, and uh, gives you output at the landscape scale. And um, 
but it's driven by a lot of empirical data. So we did go out and measure a lot of uh, forest attributes to parameterize and test this model. <coughs> so the model itself uh, seems to behave quite well. And uh, so for actually analyzing resilience, what we tried to do was simulate two kinds of disturbance. Once a one-off pulse event, a la Petritis, and another which is including uh, pulse plus press, so in other words, an ongoing um, uh, disturbance, in this case, browsing by herbivores, which is a major issue here. And what we did was simulate lots of different intensities of disturbance. And uh, here's a whole lo load of things that we measured, including, again, uh, biodiversity um, measures and, and various functions. These are the data on those gradients. Um, so we integrated those data into the model. And this is just to show you uh, some of the results of the simulations. So you can actually see, yes, it's sort of behaving at least some of the time. Uh, you're getting this drop. So you can start to immediately see after the disturbance event a drop and then a recovery, uh, giving you a chance, therefore, to measure these different components without any assumptions about multiple stable states or um, any of that. We're sort of saying, okay, let's just put that on one side. It may or may not apply to forests. Uh, the evidence is not really there, whether it does or not, these concepts. But we, nonetheless, we can use these other measures of resilience. So this is just to show you the kind of thing that we got. So here we take resistance, the first of these resilience components. Uh, what we're finding is that the two sorts of disturbance regime behave very, very similarly for more or less everything. Um, so it doesn't make much difference whether or not you include a pressed uh, a disturbance as well as the pulse. Uh, but again, sort of variety of responses here, mostly linear. Um, and uh, you, know, you can see here as you increase disturbance, a decline in the resistance of uh, things like fungi richness and things like carbon stocks in a kind of predictable way. If we look at recovery, we now start to see a very big difference between these, um, these forms of disturbance. So now we're actually seeing that uh, the, rate, you know, the, the recovery takes a lot longer in the presence of herbivores. That's what that means. So when you've got this, uh, these two forms of disturbance acting together, there's some form of interaction going on, at least for some of the functions that we looked at uh, and for some of the measures of biodiversity that um, we're actually getting a, a change away from a linear response into perhaps more of a, a non-linear. And uh, if we look at the third element, we've measured persistence. And again, it's a similar story, at least for some of the measures that we've looked at. Uh, we can start, for example, carbon and recreation, which we, we measured through a load of visitor surveys and things like that. We can actually see that, yeah, we're now getting a difference. So the results are dependent on the kind of, not only what you're looking at, but the kind of uh, disturbance regime you've got. Now, one of the things we were keen to try and test was that um, if you've got these different measures of resilience, do they correlate with each other? So ideally, they would, because if they did, if you, if you could show that resistance and recovery, for example, were, were correlated, then you could combine everything into one simple measure of resilience. But uh, that just didn't work. Uh, and that's bad news, because uh, what that means is that um, we really can't combine these things. The results are, again, dependent on which element of the system you're looking at, but also um, uh, which kind of disturbance regime you're, you're applying. So the take-home messages are these, then. Uh, we, we were quite proud of this in the sense that if one puts aside all this baggage around the existence of multiple stable states and measuring ecological resilience, if you just measure these... Uh, these three components of uh, resistance, recovery, and persistence, it's possible to measure them, or at least estimate them, using the approach of, uh, that I've highlighted here. Um, generally, what we found in, in this particular uh, woodland ecosystem was that ecosystem service and biodiversity measures were generally resilient to a one-off disturbance, but not to a one-off disturbance followed by a continuous disturbance. So in, in, in relation to management here, the issue there is then um, how do we actually uh, strengthen resilience of this forest would be about herbivore control. And if we start to think, well, what are the mechanisms underpinning um, resilience in this system, which we're just beginning to really try to get a handle on there, uh, then uh, clearly the ability of these species to regenerate is really crucial. Uh, and thirdly, these three resilient components were not consistently correlated with each other. So it's very challenging then to combine them into a single overall measure of resilience. Therefore, when we're using this word resilience, we really should be thinking about breaking it down, I think, into these different components. Thanks very much. Oh, and here's the, here's the people that can answer the questions. <laughs> That's not a problem.
<laughs> and we have time for one question still. Thank you for the talk. In your model analysis, you showed the similarities and differences between pulse disturbance and combined pulse and press disturbance. Yep. Did you also consider press disturbance only, this scenario? Uh, no, and there's a reason for that. Ellen, are you here? Yeah. Yes, so we run the model just with press. Um, one just, well, several with pulse with different intensity and one with pulse and press combined. Yeah, so we did consider only press as well. Well, I'm sorry. That's fine. No, I'm, I'm delighted. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Victoria Rapsuk from the Institute for Wildlife Research in South East Berlin. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to present you the results of meta-analysis in which we asked whether species responses to climate change are adaptive. And this work was possible uh, due to many collaborators who shared their data and was conducted at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research in Berlin, Germany. Climate change is happening. I think I don't have to convince anyone in this auditorium that this is the case. And there are several ways that species can respond to climate change. First way, which is rather the absence of response, is by going extinct. That's what happened to large blue butterfly here in the UK in the end of 70s. The second way the species can respond to climate change is by shifting the distribution range to the northward locations that are becoming more suitable with the warming climate. And Paraga agaria also shifted the distribution range northwards across the UK during the last century. The third type of response is by adapting. So either genetic adaptation, meaning microevolution, or using adaptive phenotypic plasticity. And adaptation is the focus of a talk today and of this study. And I have to notice that I'm, when I'm referring to adaptation, I mean either microevolution or adaptive phenotypic plasticity for the reasons I'm not going to detail right now. It's important to study adaptive phenotypic plasticity and adaptation because adaptive phenotypic plasticity was shown by Oliver and colleagues and Tom was so nice to introduce all this mechanism already. So adaptive phenotypic plasticity was shown to be one of the resilience mechanisms at the species level. Climate change can affect several different species traits. Phenological traits such as change in timing of the biological events are shown to be uh, affected a lot by climate. Examples of phenological traits are uh, leaf burst, egg laying date, um, flowering date, etc. And across many taxa during the last decades it was shown that the phenology is advancing. Morphological traits are also changing with climate. So for example body size or the wind span is affected by climate and is changing. The other type of traits that are changing are demographic traits for example, survival rates and reproduction. They are also changing for many species during the last decades in association with climate. So in this study we asked two questions. The first one is how does climate change affect animal traits? And to answer this question we adopted the following framework. We assume that only the changes in traits uh, are associated with the changes in climate if the trait value is associated with the climatic value and the climate factor, the climatic values are consistently changing across the years. So basically we are controlling for the absence of effect from the year on trade that is not mediated by climate. And we look at the three groups of uh, traits that are just introduced, so phenological, morphological and demographic traits. We consider four different types of climatic factors, temperature, precipitation, which is mainly rainfall, snow, and atmospheric events. Here we include North Atlantic Oscillation and Southern Oscillation Index. And we look at five different taxa, reptiles, amphibians, birds, insects, and mammals. Okay, so the second question we ask is, if the changes in traits are there, 
are these changes adaptive? And basically, uh, for the changes in trades that are uh, triggered by the systematic changes in climate to be adaptive, there should be a respective benefit in terms of fitness. So here's the example of the egg laying dates that are shown to be advancing with the warming climate. But this advancement in egg laying date, dates is only adaptive if it's also associated with increasing fitness. For example, um, f calculated as the number of fledglings. So we're talking about selection here. Okay, in our framework, there are three important effects that are taken into account. First, the change of climate across the years. Second, the change of trade with climate. And third, selection, or how the fitness is changing with the trade values. And it can be shown that the product of these three effects corresponds to the opportunity of selection. Opportunity of selection is the metric that is well known in genetics and evolution to represent adaptation of species. For the short, I will, for the sake of short, or sake of shortness, I will call this adaptation metric. Sorry, and um, if the value of adaptation metric is significantly higher than zero, then we talk that the trade is adaptive. The change in trade is adaptive. If the change, if the value of this metric is significantly lower than zero, then the trade is maladaptive. And if the uh, value of this metric is overlapping with zero, we talk about neutral response or simply phenotypic plasticity without adaptation. And now I would like you to keep in mind that adaptation metric is the product of these three effects. So whenever one of the effects is zero, it means that we, very, uh, we are likely to end up with the neutral response. So to answer these two research questions, we conducted a systematic, systematic literature review looking for the studies that recorded change of traits in time, focusing on terrestrial animals. We only looked at those studies that uh, quantified quantitative phenotypic traits, so we discarded the studies looking at coloration. And for the second question that asked whether the traits are, changes in traits are adaptive, we uh, search for the studies that quantified selection. And now what we have, we have more than 5,000 uh, records in the database that can be used to answer the first question, so whether the changes in traits are triggered by the systematic changes in climate across the years. And a subset of this data set of 122 records also has data on selection. So basically these 122 records can be used to answer the question whether species uh, changes, uh, whether the changes in traits of species are adaptive in response to climate change. And that's what we have. The full data set that consists of over 5,000 records is represented by 46 studies and covering 880 species. So you can see we have much less studies than records. That's because certain studies report relationship for many species, and for each species you can have several different trait categories that are linked to several different uh, climatic factors. Mainly, the data is located in northern hemisphere, and unfortunately, southern hemisphere are understudied. And this is a subset of those 122 records for which we had the data on selection. Um, Again, these are 26 studies that are conducted on 14 species, and you can see that they are predominantly located in Europe. So what do we cover in this data set? The full data set is shown in black and the subset of 122 records with selection in orange. And you can see that there is a bias towards studying phenological traits in both data sets, but in the subset with the selection data, this bias is less pronounced. Also, the two data sets differ in the taxa that, are that they are predominantly focusing on. So the full data set is mainly consisting of uh, records for insects, whereas the data set on selection is focused on birds. Now, the average, uh, so the duration was of the study was from 8 to 84 years, and on average, the full data set had the studies of 19 year duration, and the average duration of the studies in the data set with selection was 28 years. 
and now the results. So here you can see the adaptation metric for 122 records that we have. On the left are shown studies, but you don't, you don't see them, and that's not a problem, because the main message here is that most of them are neutral, shown in dark gray. I hope you can see that majority of them are gray and overlapping with zero. And actually, when we run the random effect model across the studies, there is also zero adaptation. There is only one maladaptive response and 11 records that showed adaptation. So then we asked, okay, are those 11 records maybe species specific or specific to a certain trait category? But that's not the case. Again, here, the gray is for neutral responses and black for adaptive responses. And you can see that for any single species, for example, uh, gray teeth here, for the species that we see black symbols and gray symbols, there are both of them. So the species cannot explain adaptation. Neither, statistically, we could not explain adaptation by trait type or climatic factor type. Then what explains adaptation? Why do majority of these responses are neutral? And now let's remember that adaptation metric is a product of those three effects. And let's decompose it and look at each effect in turn. So now we look at the first effect, how climate changes across this, the years. So this slope plotted in the, um, again for all 122 studies, from the smallest negative to the highest positive value. Uh, again, the black shows those responses that were adaptive and gray, the neutral responses. On average, you can see here that in majority of the cases, this slope is overlapping with zero. So basically, in those 122 studies, the climate didn't change with years. Now, the second effect, uh, the effect of climate on, on trade, we see much more variation here, and we clearly see that there are some studies that show negative response, significantly negative or significantly positive response. And basically on average here we see a significantly positive response here shown by gray dashed line. So on average the studies uh, showed significantly positive change in trade with climatic factor. And the third panel selection, again there is much less variation than on the second panel and on average there is no selection across all 122 records. So the neutral response that we see for adaptation is because of either there was no change in climate across this, the years for those 122 records, or and there is also no selection on the studied trait. And I would like just to highlight it with the small visualization for two species. So here on three um, axis, you can see these three effects. On axis X, the effect of year on climate. On axis Y, the effect of climate on trade and the selection on axis Z. And in two different colors, I highlight two species that are barn swallow in uh, violet. That species didn't uh, showed only neutral responses. And uh, blue teeth in cyan has shown some uh, adaptive responses. And what we can see, if you just focus on the violet dots, any of them very often falls at zero value for at least one of the uh, axes. So with this, I would like to conclude. Studies on selection, unfortunately, focus mostly on birds. And we need more studies on mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. They are possible and they are there, but they are not commonly done. We found 9% of inter inspected species and traits that showed adaptive response. Neutral response is often easier because there is no change of climate with years or and there is no selection. And it still remains questionable whether 9% of adaptation found in our records is meaning that species can adapt or not. Because remember the average duration of those studies are 30 years, which is fairly short. And I would like to thank you all for attention.
Hi, thanks for the talk. I just was wondering if your results might change depending on the fitness measure that did you use. Like, it was the fitness measure consistent across the different studies or? Uh, no, we actually used several different fitness measures because as you can imagine, uh, they didn't use all the same measures, but we tested for that and fitness measure doesn't have effect, which may be because there are not so many studies in the end to test for, we had four different uh, fitness measures that were used and for 122 records, it's, uh, yeah, but there was no, uh, no significant response. All right, thanks. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Volker. So my name is Rachel Standish. I'm a plant ecologist at Murdoch University in Perth, Western Australia. I like experiments, and today I'd like to share with you um, some thinking we've done recently to understand what experiments might tell us about resilience of communities to disturbance. My co-author is Nancy Shackelford. Nancy is a PhD student based at uh, the University of Victoria in British Columbia. Uh, Nancy is also a plant community ecologist and um, one of her experiments is, is pictured on this title slide here um, and she has a special talent uh, with numbers. In December 2013, uh, Nancy, myself and Jane Catford sitting in the front row here, used to be with Australian National University now with the University of Southampton, um, invited a group of ecologists to a workshop at Rottnest Island off the coast of uh, West Western Australia, um, primarily with the aim of asking the question, are there community attributes that confer uh, resilience to disturbance? Uh, each of these ecologists was invited because they possessed um, data sets that allowed us to uh, look at this question. So um, each of them had data sets that tested uh, community, that's a community level data, responses to necessarily discrete disturbances, and then um, monitoring data beyond then, uh, beyond the disturbance uh, to track their, their recovery through time. So what we um, ended up with uh, was 14 studies of, of community response to disturbance, but there were multiple data sets at, at each of these um, stars on the world map. So we had uh, 27 individual comparisons of um, how communities respond uh, to disturbance. Uh, the types of communities were quite diverse. Uh, so we had ecologists with uh, data sets for coral reef, tropical forest and, and the rest there. So both um, uh, terrestrial and uh, aquatic ecosystems. And uh, a, a bunch of different disturbances, um, including both uh, human-induced and the more wild-type uh, disturbances. Uh, we settled on our definitions of, of resilience and we referred back to um, Holling's original um, definition that you've um, already heard uh, speakers mention here today. Um, there was a general agreement that this uh, definition was useful because it um, defined um, a threshold between uh, the sort of desirable states, if you like, and these um, alternative um, degraded states that communities may shift into uh, occasionally. <coughs> Uh, we also liked PIM's um, definition of resilience because of its focus on time, uh, time being something that was easily, easily measurable and um, also something that managers um, might find useful and because one of the original motivations for the workshop was to understand how the resilience concept might be uh, useful to managers, um, we adopted this uh, definition as well. Uh, then we had to decide on um, a measure of recovery um, and as Tom illustrated in uh, his talk, there is no ideal measure um, but after much discussion we um, settled on compositional dissimilarity uh, which is essentially um, the, uh, these are in ordination space, um, these are species composition of disturbed and control plots. 
um, and we measured the distance between um, each of the disturbed and then the, the centroid of those control plots. The control plots were either um, spatial or, or temporal, um, so um, people either had measured um, the communities prior to disturbance or they'd measured the communities in an adjacent undisturbed uh, habitat. We also explored the use of uh, species richness um, as a metric to um, measure community response to disturbance, but found that that um, performed really um, poorly as a predictor of response in, in our models. Um, we talked about using trait-based approaches, but um, there were basically not enough data to, um, to fill out the response variables for trait-based approaches. We came up with a list of over 20 explanatory variables that described both the disturbance um, and the community attributes, as well as time, as um, a way of looking at community response. And after eliminating um, the uh, co-variation among those and um, also explanatory variables that weren't uh, significant in the models, we came up with these um, ones here. So the size of the species pool was essentially the list of um, species that were unique to both control and disturbed plots. Landscape connectivity was a binary measure, um, essentially if the disturbance was uh, l much larger than the community, then the landscape connectivity was given a score of zero, where if the disturbance was um, discrete in space and there were undisturbed patches around um, the plots that were measured thereafter, then landscape con connectivity was given a score of one. Disturbance intensity um, was rated by each of the authors of the study um, relative to the size of disturbances of similar type in that landscape um, over the century prior to um, uh, measurement. Um, time since disturbance in years and then standardised by the average generation time of the organisms in that community um, and in our case um, spanned from uh, months for some of the microarthropod communities uh, through to years for some of the plant communities and then decades uh, for corals and other um, forests, for example. We came up with some fairly um, simple predictions. I'll just present the sort of linear predictions, but of course um, non-linear responses are, are quite possible too. Um, we, for the, with time on the x-axis here, and compositional um, dissimilarity on the Y. A very simple prediction is that compositional dissimilarity will decrease um, with time. That is, that we'll see recovery. Um, alternatively, um, communities may not recover in time and um, they might uh, trail off to an alternative uh, state. We hypothesise that in communities with stronger underlying resilience facilitating mechanisms, um, what we might see is um, a faster recovery time. Or in fact, um, communities might start off um, being more similar after disturbance because of increased resistance to disturbance um, and then um, uh, take some, and then have a similar rate of recovery but end up recovering uh, more quickly. Uh, or a combination of those two um, things. And when we hypothesise that with increased severity of disturbance, um, communities might be pushed further away from their pre-disturbance state, but might have um, a similar rate of recovery, but ultimately take a bit longer, or they um, may not recover at all. So, as I say, fa fairly simple predictions. Um, there are more complicated ones, but um, they're, they're the ones we settled on. And what did we find? Um, we found, uh, so I've plotted just um, compositional dissimilarity increasing across um, this arrow here. Uh, we found very quick recovery in forest plant communities um, two years after Hurricane Gilbert, so um, their compositional dissimilarity to the control plots uh, was low. Um, similarly, uh, bryophyte communities um, showed a fair degree of recovery uh, 35 years after clear cutting in Swedish forest. 
And similarly for um, fish communities uh, nine months after an anoxia event in an Australian estuary, um, whereas a wetland plant community uh, six months after Hurricane Katrina had showed almost no uh, recovery whatsoever. Um, then we did some modelling, or rather Nancy did, um, and to do that she first um, converted these um, compositional dissimilarities to Hedges G, which essentially standardises those measures among the different studies um, while allowing for the variance among them. Um, and she used uh, linear mixed models uh, to look at the contribution of those explanatory variables to describing um, recovery, and she found Oops, sorry, a significant um, effect of connectivity. So essentially um, plots that were connected to undisturbed plots uh, showed a um, more similarity or, or less dissimilarity uh, than uh, compared with uh, plots that were unconnected in the landscape. Uh, she also found uh, a relationship between generation time and recovery. So essentially, um, as the number of generations increased, um, the dissimilarity between um, disturbed and control plots um, decreased. But of course, um, these data are strongly um, biased or, or leveraged by um, this study here, which was the snail community. Um, study in, in Sweden where there had been lots of generations um, uh, turnover in that um, time and uh, this study here which had a higher dissimilarity which was the um, rangelands in, um, after the removal of summer grazing in the US. Uh, we found no um, relationship of disturbance attributes to recovery so no um, significant predictors there. So we concluded um, from this meta-analysis that um, connectivity and time are important and um, that's what these particular experiments um, taught us about resilience. So in, I've just shown a, a photo here of an old field in southwestern Australia where um, connectivity to remnant bushland for seed sources has shown to be important for the recovery of the old field after the removal of um, grazing. Um, and I've put these um, taller trees in here as a reminder that um, for some of our long-lived communities that um, time is um, a long time <laughs> for recovery. <coughs> More generally though, um, we recognise the limitations of experiments and some of the speakers before me have um, talked about this too, that essentially um, the big five um, uh, disturbances that we are dealing with globally are, are press disturbances rather than pulse disturbances and um, their sy synergistic effects um, are also something that we're, we're grappling with and um, experiments uh, are not possible um, for these. Do we want re resilience or, or even um, resistance and how do we understand um, community uh, responses to these? In another paper, um, we thought about this in the context of management. Uh, we've got the utility of experiments over here for these short-term, small-scale um, disturbances where it's um, possible to identify thresholds and potentially manage uh, systems away from those, um, whereas for these long-term, large-scale um, disturbances, uh, we essentially need some um, proxies to tell us about uh, resilience and resistance and um, again Tom gave us some good ideas about um, what proxies we might look to. Another unresolved issue that we raised in this um, paper that I just mentioned was this idea of unhelpful resilience. So um, we've been talking so far about management to maintain resilience in this um, desirable blue ball state. Um, but what we see increasingly in the world is these um, degraded states that are also resilient and I've shown again an old field in southwestern Western Australia which has persisted in this weedy state um, despite being abandoned over um, 40 years ago. It's not returning to the historic woodland. Um, why is that so? And what are the mechanisms um, underpinning the resilience of that degraded state and, and how do we overcome that? 
So in conclusion, um, we found with our study that landscape connectivity predicted um, community recovery to disturbance. So from a management perspective, um, planting trees to link remnant vegetation could be um, one way to um, improve resilience into the future. Number of generations was a significant but uh, weak predictor of recovery in our measure analysis. Experiments are impractical for large scale press disturbances um, and there's a possibility there that uh, connectivity might be a proxy and there are other suggestions too. And finally, the resilience mechanisms for um, degraded states are unknown and um, important to, f to find out as well. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors and um, funders for this work. Thank you. that analyzing unwanted resilience is actually quite promising in understanding basic resilience mechanisms. Because, for example, the metapopulation concept has been developed and people try to eradicate a species. So it was un unwanted resilience. So it's, it's not only a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> good idea, Valka. You've had lots of good ideas that have informed this session. You just had another one. Well, the very short answer. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I didn't have a PDF, but a PowerPoint. Okay, great. And I, I'm very, uh, very pleased to talk about resiliencing a concept which uh, Volker and Hannah are promoting now. And this is really to operationalize uh, risk and resilience management in biodiversity and ecosystem services uh, conservation. And um, Following my predecessors, this is my quote from Volker, because he inspired me really years ago at the uh, German uh, meeting of the uh, Society of Ecology with a talk which he began with exactly this, uh, this quote, in German obviously, frogs don't cry, and here he explained uh, the stability concepts and dynamics of, of change and uncertainties and what this means and for a frog population in a, uh, in, in a metapopulation of, of lakes and what do they do. Um, uh, they don't know how the lakes are going to, or the ponds are going to look like, next year, and, but there are obviously um, tools to assess this and to assess change and dynamics of this. And I think this will be the, uh, the main gist of this talk. And um, where we're looking at uh, global problems, which I think my pre, uh, pre uh, uh, speakers have uh, alluded to, um, we have so far uh, often as ecologists obviously concentrated on the biological and ecological uh, systems. And we do know that at the moment, and this is no news, that we are losing species much faster and, um, than at the natural rates. And at the same time, we have to say we are living in a system where we are actually, at least in the UK, Germany, Europe, um, as well as uh, internationally, we have policy goals which are very strong. We have very strong uh, conservation uh, regulations, but we're missing these. We've missed the 2010 goals, and uh, 2020 is, is uh, with the IG targets is already on our doorsteps. But why is this? Because we are often neglecting the social systems here, and I think we would like to introduce this within resiliencing, so that we, if we can match these, that we can uh, then move towards more informed decisions and integrated solutions. So, how can we move from concepts to actions? So, how can we move from the question, what do you mean by resilience, to what do you want to use this concept for? And maybe this can uh, bring us uh, further. And this, uh, the analogy which uh, we discussed also last night was physics don't necessarily tell us what mass, energy, and so on is, but really use this uh, concepts to formulate uh, theories on, um, and testable theories of, uh, to allow for actions um, to, to move forward. And fortunately, we can build on substantial literature now, and I think we've, we've seen this also in, in the previous talks, um, on, on resilience. And now the task is really, how can we translate these heuristic principles into action and into practice, and how to operationalize this? And therefore, um, Volker and Hannah have coined the term resilience sing, which obviously the ing is something about doing, about putting it into practice. 
and uh, this uh, came out of long discussions with colleagues um, uh, at the Helmholtz Center of uh, Environment Research and others towards uh, looking at how the concept of resiliency to, um, uh, could be used across uh, and looked at across different time horizons and decision contexts. And I think these two, uh, two variables are important here. So what are the main reasons for reducing this resilience thing, which obviously caused co co some co controversies controversy also in the group, to really move from a vaguely defined property, the resilience, to actions and decisions that are required to uh, deliver or ensure the sustained capacity of ecosystems uh, to deliver ecosystem services. I said ecosystem services. This can be quite controversial towards defining what we really want to ecosystems, uh, what ecosystem features we mean. Is it biodiversity? Is it ecosystem functions or is it services? If we are looking at ecosystem services, these are obviously a, a matter of societal choice and therefore depending on the uh, societal context and the policy context, and it brings some normativity in there as well. Not necessarily that the science is normative, but um, that obviously there are different contexts to be decided and these will impact also on the resilience. And then secondly, that by defining those variables, what we're talking about, that we can identif and identify uh, and clarify the scales at which we're working, the decision context, the pressures, and the different time horizons. And there we uh, name three. So really, the aim is in questions, in other words, is how can resiliency help us to, uh, to move towards restoring, maintaining, or uh, developing resilience mechanisms at all relevant uh, levels of organizations and across spatial scales, really to better understand how ecosystems are generated in socio-ecological systems to understand how we manage them uh, in a global change and to identify management options. So if we think about three different time horizons or di three different modes, and they don't, they're not necessarily exclusive, but they uh, relate to different time horizons, um, probably also spatial scales and decision contexts. We have reactive resiliency, which is often across uh, short time horizons. Um, and they are often under high um, perceived urgency or social pressure. So for example, a local pest outbreak or a flooding event and resource managers have to act or policy um, or decision makers have to act and there are uh, short term intervention measures. These are usually uh, do more of the same or, or increase, uh, increase uh, resistance. Adjustive resiliency can happen over intermediate time horizon. So if we know that there is a trend, a continuing trend in ecosystem service loss will happen, for example, a decline of pollinators, resource managers have the option to foster adjustment and, for example, uh, implement habitat connectivity. These two are really um, leaving the system where it is and trying to improve it, trying to make it um, yeah, tr trying to keep keep the same uh, um, same characteristics, um, but really it's not really questioning the uh, the system in itself. Provident resiliencing actually can uh, looks at longer time horizons and probably also greater spatial scales. Threats are often unclear or unspecific. They may be clear, like climate change, um, but not necessary to the sites, and there is no specific trigger for action. And here, other measures can happen. Uh, for example, large reserve networks could be used in order to harbor certain functions which we want to use. And there, I think the idea of looking at services which we want to provide, but maybe uh, compromising on the species composition can come in. This also allows for translocation of species, obviously very uh, controversial um, uh, issue with conservation managers, and to actively embrace change and manage change and proactive uh, transformation. This is a very controversial uh, discussion in conservation, um, both in conservation science as well as practice. And this is along an axis of um, time where we have obviously urgency versus uncertainty. And let me explain this now. How can we then now move to operationalizing this? And one example, for example, would be to look at the system in more detail. So for example, using uh, operating network theory um, for resiliency. And here we need a mechanistic understanding of linkages between biodiversity, ecosystem functions, and uh, uh, ecosystem service and socio-ecological systems. I won't go into the detail with this, but when we started this in an SDEV working group, um, we thought about first and, uh, about the conventional ecosystem service cascade, moving from properties to functions to capacities of uh, flow and benefits and values. These lead to societal responsible and driving forces. But somehow we got muddled up. I mean, there, there are lots of networks where we interact, but then 
And uh, they, these are complex systems which are linear and nonlinear. They are obviously coupled and they are dynamic. And these need to be understood. But actually, we are leaving sort of, we are always, this is an um, approach which we're often taking, but then we stop at some point because we can't get further. And then we thought, no, actually, we have to really. We have to really be uh, look at the decision context first and the actions, and from there on, at the same time, uh, uh, look at the systems, the ecological, the social, and the driver systems in order then to arrive at, um, at services. And uh, there, if we look at the systems with the species, how they relate to ecosystem services, for example, water quality and coastal protection, there may be some relationships which are quite clear. If we look at social systems, there can be quite, um, uh, can be very different dynamics there. And this allows us to, uh, to go into, uh, to look at models. These can start with very simple models, and these should not be disclaimed, so influence diagrams, to static network analyses, to more dynamic system models. And I think here we should also uh, t um, be brave to learn also from the social sciences to look at the social network analysis, and they can obviously learn a lot from full web um, ecology as well. And uh, what is important here is if we look at the system dynamics, that we look at the network top topology and the um, nature and form of perturbation and where impact um, uh, is happening and, and what, uh, or the impact depends on where some, what is disturbed. And if we here look at both the ecological systems as well as the social systems, we can identify nodes and interactions. And nodes in the ecological systems could be ecological entities like species, or in the social systems, obviously, actors, people, organizations, but also policies. Um, and ecosystem services could be seen as natural capital stocks. If we look at the interactions, they obviously in food webs, they, they may be traffic, but in a social systems, this can be a flow inf of information or resources, um, but also friendships, and these need to be understood. So if these are perturbed, this can uh, um, actually uh, uh, threaten the resilience of a system. And here, we also introduce ecosystem services as flows, as information flows, and as you can see, this is a relationship to physics again. Is ecosystem service a particle or a wave? Um, and we dodged this issue in this paper, at least. So, uh, but it is important to understand the systems dynamics in order to, uh, to arrive at actions. And now, with my last two slides, I would just like to come to a practical example. This is some work which we did where we actually uh, surveyed conservation managers across Europe and asked them, well, how do you actually deal with climate change? How do you, what are, how is this implemented in your goals? And how is this implemented in your management actions? Um, and I'll just show one slide. Um, and so most of the managers actually said, well, the main thing which we're doing is we maintain existing species and we maintain the current ecosystem. This is obviously driven by policy. This is designation of protected areas demands you to do this. You cannot actually change necessarily species composition. It's actually not, um, yeah, it's, it would be in some cases against the laws. It was very nice to see that many, uh, so 68% of the managers has also said that they are looking into increasing ecological connectivity both within sites, so within larger, for example, um, uh, uh, national, national parks. Um, or between sites, but this was, uh, was less often the case because there was no political incentive. And, but enabling ecosystem service change, either passively or, ch uh, or actively, was less pronounced. And obviously, uh, and this was more in water systems, for example, uh, that experienced flooding, or in marine systems where, for example, dikes were removed and where there, and, uh, people had more experience with this and where also there was pressure to do so. Enabling new species was a concept which was not favored by many and which was not practiced by, uh, by many. So really, in reality, at the moment, we are working with conservation managers. They're still at the uh, reactive and adjusting resiliency. There is only very timid approaches, or I wouldn't say timid approaches. This is also fostered by the policies um, that provident resiliency is often not possible. And uh, here we can see how, how this could work, and by an analyzing the system, we can obviously hopefully also uh, arrive at a management options for this. So the thing we need is a plan, and I would just like to uh, briefly uh, uh, outline a stepwise approach how we could uh, move towards resiliencing. So first of all, identify the resiliencing decision context. Secondly, define the ecosystem service of interest and scale. At, at which time and space are we working at? 
At the same time, uh, link ecosystem services within the ecological network, so ecosystem services to species and ecosystem functions, but also look at the socioeconomic network and link beneficiaries and users of ecosystem services um, or ecosystem service managers within the network. Identify the drivers and assign the vulnerabilities. So assign the risks and vulnerabilities not only to the nodes but the whole system so that we can assess the stability properties of ecosystem service provision uh, over time and within the system. And this then leads us to identify plausible resiliencing actions and alternatives. And obviously, um, as you would do, is you also assess direct and indirect impacts on, on ecosystem services which you weren't looking at. And this will probably be an iterative cycle. So in conclusion, I hope resiliencing, uh, we could make clear in our talk uh, that resiliencing of ecosystem services encompasses more than one type of resiliencing and uh, this de depends on the time horizon you look at and the willingness of to accept and to uh, manage change and to actually proactively maybe anticipate some tipping points or shift uh, regime shifts and maybe help a system cross that. But this is something which um, has, has been not very much explored yet move towards a more a mechanistic understanding, and I think uh, many of the pre-speakers also said this, of resiliency to inform action, and uh, network uh, theory is one tool to help, so that frogs don't need to cry. Thank you. Thanks a lot for a very interesting talk. I just have two questions. First one, in, when you talk about ecosystem services, did you actually uh, look at different type of services? I mean, provisioning services or cultural services, so or just general. And then I was wondering if you are looking at this resiliencing in case studies where you have indigenous and local knowledge, ILK, because uh, in those cases, and local what? Knowledge. Okay. ILK mm -hmm. cases. Yeah. Uh, so that's all. Thanks. <laughs> so at the moment, I think you've you've uh, outlined a fra uh, an action action framework what to do. Uh, at the moment, we haven't uh, we haven't applied the system yet, and I, uh, we would like to now look at case studies, obviously across the whole range of ecosystem services. I think with provisioning services is um, mostly easy uh, or easier because we have got more data. I think there were some really nice examples of, of regulating services and I think we do need to work uh, with cultural um, services. As you say, um, I think and this relates to the IPBES uh, discussions obviously with I, uh, indigenous and local knowledge. Um, this is obviously something where resilience can be uh, strengthened and uh, in the paper we had a, an example of the red river gum tree where for example local knowledge was ignored and uh, um, we uh, there was a region in Australia where a floodplain was um, um, the red river gum tree uh, was uh, suffering from drought and uh, what the uh, water authorities did was that they uh, flooded the system, but unfortunately not really looking at the system at the ecological network, and because they did this in summer, there was a huge black water event because the uh, dried leaves um, uh, obviously uh, um, decomposed. And uh, and uh, uh, and that's that gave a big backlash in the, uh, so they, uh, the, f there was a fish dieback and that was a big um, backlash in the, uh, with populations and they actually turned against the water authorities. If they had asked the local uh, people, obviously this wouldn't have happened. And so I think this is uh, this interplay of um, ecological and local as well as this system knowledge is needed. Yeah. So thank you very much, um, Hannah and Volker, for inviting me to speak in this really interesting symposium. So yes, I'm going to talk about uh, resilience at large scales, and I, and I do mean large scales compared to uh, what many of the other speakers have talked about. So I'm going to talk about some work at um, national scale and actually at international scale. Um, I was going to show the same table from Tom's tree paper, but we've seen it twice already. Uh, but my talk is definitely in the right-hand column of that, which is called Landscape Scales. Um, and I'm looking at whole ecosystems um, and landscape connectivity in terms of resilience. 
So this comes from Tom's paper two, which we've also seen, and this is what I'm going to use as an operational definition of resilience, uh, recognizing this problem that the word has very many different meanings in different contexts. Uh, in the second half of my talk, I'm going to use a different definition because uh, that's looking at the human development agenda. But um, I think this is a useful way to bring together these ideas that it's about disturbance, which may be a press or pulse disturbance. And in my case, these are mostly uh, large scale, long term press disturbances. Uh, although in the second half, I'll talk about some pulse disturbance. And then there are two components to resilience, um, the uh, resistance and the recovery. But the really important thing from my point of view is uh, the amount of time that the system is uh, in this undesirable state, that there's some required um, ecosystem function, or actually I'm going to talk more about ecosystem services, <coughs> there's some required level, and what you want to avoid is being uh, in that red area where that uh, level of ecosystem functional service is not being reliably delivered. And my conceptual framework is this very simple one that we have um, ecosystems and there are ecosystem functions going on within those ecosystems and people manage and uh, add uh, various kinds of nutrients and um, uh, management practices to those ecosystems in order to deliver certain kinds of services. And the reason they do that is because of uh, the need for some benefits in wider society. So I'm going to start by thinking more about the benefits here. I, I may be talking about resiliencing, having listened to a letter, I think. Um, so I'm going to start with the benefits, what it is that we want to, requ what we require, what it is that we want to maintain, and then think about what you've got to do within the ecosystem to maintain that ecosystem at the level at which those benefits are being sustainably delivered. And of course, one of the really complicated things is that when you get to these benefits, it's not just about ecosystems, it's about all sorts of other things that people do. Um, it requires other sorts of built and human capital of um, having fields and roads and um, agricultural vehicles and chemicals and processing plants and supermarkets and so on. But um, in, in principle, what we're talking about is the ecosystem part of those um, benefits from ecosystem services. So in the first example, I'm going to think about uh, what might be the uh, level of provision of ecosystem functions that puts these benefits at risk. What is it that you might do to ecosystems that would take them to a point at which they weren't uh, sustainably and reliably delivering these benefits? And that may be because of some kind of ongoing disturbance. Uh, it could be climate change, it could be land use change, it could be the ongoing addition of um, nutrients or land management or something. And this project was um, something I did with the Natural Capital Committee in the UK to develop a simple risk register for natural capital in the, in the UK. So the idea is very uh, broad scale that we're just going to look at this set of benefits that ecosystems deliver and ask about the relationships that there are between those benefits and certain kinds of ecosystem condition. And we use the UK's land use classes, habitat classification as a, as a first step and for each um, land use class or habitat type, we classified that relationship between benefits and eco ecosystem condition uh, depending on the quantity, the quality, and the spatial configuration. So this is what the area of that habitat type is, how, what its management is like, its condition, um, and then its spatial configuration, things like connectedness, fragmentation, and location. And this was a very broad scale analysis, just using existing national level data. Uh, wherever possible, we tried to build in the ecological thresholds. There's lots of uncertainty in here, but we tried to reflect that in the outcome. And really importantly, as in the definition of resilience, you've got to have a target. You've got to have this required level below which you don't want to go. And we used various policy um, objectives to give us that target level. 
And this is the result of the risk register. Just this is a summary of the, um, all the evidence that went into it. So here are these habitat types, mountain moors and heaths, enclosed farmland, semi-natural grassland, woodlands, freshwater, urban, coastal margins, and marine. And here are these benefits that society needs from uh, ecosystems. And if it's red, uh, then the condition of the ecosystem in that habitat type, in either quantity, quality, or spatial configuration, is either below the target level already, or is only just above it and declining rapidly. So that would be a red flag in the risk register. If it's yellow, it's close to the target, or it's declining very slowly from being just above it. And if it's green, everything looks okay. It's above the target level. So you can see some very striking signals. There, there are lots of gray areas which are um, unforgivably, actually, a mixture of we don't know and it doesn't matter. And I realize those two are not the same things, but different shades of gray are difficult to show. So, uh, so there's lots of unknowns in there as well as the doesn't matters. But you can see that there are quite a lot of cases where quantity is sufficient, but quality is a problem, or spatial configuration. These things are in the wrong place or aren't well connected. Um, and then there are some benefits that are clearly at risk. Wildlife is clearly at risk as a benefit. Aesthetics turned out not to be such a problem. Water is a problem both as a benefit and as an ecosystem. And this uh, simple analysis uh, enabled us to come up with a set of recommendations to government about the elements, uh, the benefits from natural capital that are at high risk in the risk register. So this is clean water, wildlife, carbon storage, hazard protection, recreation, clean air, and fisheries. And for each of those, we could come up with a management recommendation. So that's one example of using um, resilience type thinking at a national scale, assuming that you've got these target levels. Now, my second example is very different um, and takes ecology into the development and global change literature. And um, here, resilience has a very different meaning. Uh, I, I'm, talking, I'm going to talk about this study that I did with the Royal Society on resilience to extreme weather. And we used the Rockefeller's definition of resilience, um, which is quite widely used in the development literature. And it's the capacity of individuals, communities, and systems to survive, adapt, and grow in the face of stress and shocks, and even transform when conditions require it. So you see, this is rather different to what us ecologists use, in that you have this kind of trajectory of, um, of resilience that takes you into this transformational change. So the idea in development is you may be facing lots of shocks and pressures, but through being resilient, uh, you survive, you adapt, and you even transform in order to develop at the same time as these pressures are underway. Oops, sorry. Uh, so in this one, what I'm doing now is moving right over here to think about hazard regulation. I'm going to look at the hazard regulating benefits of ecosystems in this um, development context. And the problem here is that um, over the next 100 years or so, given climate change and population growth, there are going to be many times more, more uh, extreme weather events that will threaten very large numbers of people. So this comes out of running climate models, GCMs, on an annual basis and looking at the extremes for uh, rainfall and temperature and looking at spatially in the world where they will be and linking that to population growth. So you see here's the increased incidence of heat waves, extreme peri protracted periods of hot, dry weather. Um, those will become three times more frequent as events because of climate change, four times more frequent as events because of population growth, and the multiple of those is 12. So there'll be 12 times as many drought events um, as there are at the moment. And these are the, uh, sorry, heat wave events. And these are the flood and drought measures. So there is a, there's a problem about people's resilience to extreme weather. And in the face of that problem, there are three kinds of things that can be done. Um, engineered solutions, ecosystem-based solutions, 
and a hybrid of the two. And this is an engineered solution. This is the Thames barrier. Uh, this is an ecosystem-based solution using natural um, dams. And this would be a hybrid where these are artificially supported dune systems. You put in some structure to help dunes grow and establish themselves. So we did an analysis of these three kinds of interventions for the resilience of human societies in the face of extreme weather. And we did this by, um, it turns out to be very difficult to get the data. Not The metrics are very complicated um, and many people are measuring different things all the time. So we had to use a rather informal um, scoring and expert-based assessment, which is what I'm showing you here. But for all these different interventions, so this is interventions for coastal flooding, uh, ranging from uh, maintaining reefs or mangroves uh, down to coastal barrages and dikes and levees and so on. So, and then we looked at the effectiveness, how well they worked, and the affordability, how costly they were. So you'd really like to be up here. It's cheap, it's affordable, and effective. But uh, inevitably, these things uh, have a negative relationship, so the more effective ones um, are more expensive. So here are the uh, dams and levees. But you see some of these ecosystem-based ones, that's the mangroves and, uh, wet and salt marsh wetlands, turn out to be pretty effective um, as well as being rather cheap. Um, some of the ecosystem-based ones uh, really don't work very well at all. Here's the same thing for river flooding. You get the same um, negative relationship, so uh, expensive but effective at protecting people from flooding are dams. Um, but some of the other things, uh, floodplains, uh, green rivers and so on, turn out to be pretty effective. So overall, the, when we looked across a whole range of um, systems, these ecosystem-based interventions, this is now using ecosystems for resilience, uh, turned out to be cheap, but are not as effective. In fact, in the case of um, persistent and um, difficult to deal with pressures, this effectiveness measure becomes rather difficult because dams may be effective until they break. Um, and then you have this catastrophic um, end point of the, um, of the environmental pressures. Whereas the ecosystem ones, when they fail, they fail very slowly and gradually, so people are able to deal with failure. So the, the effectiveness scoring became quite tricky. Because the great thing about the ecosystem-based solutions is that they have many co-benefits. They're not just protecting people from heat waves or flooding, they are also providing co-benefits to do with food, livelihoods, climate change mitigation, uh, access to water, biodiversity conservation, and other sorts of hazards as well. So if you now look at the ecosystem base, which are green, um, compared to the uh, engineered ones, which are gray, the number of co-benefits from the <coughs> ecosystem ones are nearly always better. So the uh, one of the conclusions from this is that these ecosystem-based solutions offer many opportunities in a development context in the face of this um, rapidly increasing problem from extreme weather events that also provide co-benefits and give local communities much more um, involvement and authority over their own defence mechanisms. Generally, uh, it it's better not to have one single kind of measure, just the engineered ones uh, rules out many options. But the most important thing was to find a way of uh, monitoring and evaluating these hybrid and the um, ecosystem-based adaptations to actually find out what really does work. The database on this um, is really uh, chaotic because many people are measuring different things about success in ecosystem-based adaptation. They're not necessarily measuring success as did it work for protecting human societies. Quite often the success is did it work for species richness or biodiversity conservation or for improved income or livelihoods or whatever. And so there's a, there's a real need for a better evidence base. 
Uh, you can read about the, this uh, resilience uh, in the Royal Society, actually. There's a very long web link there, but if you just Google Royal Society and resilience, you'll find it, and all the data and the evidence is there. So, um, conclusions from this. I, uh, I, I agree with all the other speakers in this session that resilience has become um, a very important component of these human nature relationships, and I think it's got great promise um, to help us make that case to society about why um, ecological um, systems and ecological interactions are so important. But uh, as many others have said, it is very loosely defined, especially across disciplines, and we have very few uh, good metrics. Um, if we had good metrics, I think we could make a very strong case about how to use ecological resilience more usefully. When you do define it, when you define it um, in a way that you can actually study it, you can use it both to identify ecosystem conditions that provide resilient functions and services, that's something that everyone's interested in, but as I've shown in the second half, uh, you can also use it in this wider global change, um, human vulnerability and development um, arena to look at uh, ways of supporting people facing extreme weather. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Regina. We have time for one question. Thank you, that was an excellent talk. My question spans the last two talks. Given the importance in the human nature relationship of capitals, you, you started with, with natural capital, and Aletta was talking about links and, and networks and flows. Is it time and are there benefits of moving to a multi-capital approach where we're considering the social capital, for example, of resilience and the human capital of knowledge, be it local, be it international? And yet we seem to be focusing mostly on natural capital, which has always puzzled me. Do you see a move to a multi-capital approach? Um, I mean, I, I certainly agree with you that you cannot think about the kinds of things I've been talking about without also considering human and produced capital. You need the three of them, natural, human, and produced. Uh, we are starting to make some way headway uh, with the policy world in natural capital, and I think there's a way to go there. The human capital side are also making headway in terms of education and uh, development and so on, but they're not uh, in any um, proactive way linked to the natural capital side. So, and, and they are, and they should be. I agree with you. So, yes, I, I, I think your your point is a good one. Thank you very much again, Georgina. Thank you. Thanks to all speakers. Let me just summarise the session with two sentences. First of all. I think we all agree resilience is a fuzzy concept, but that something is fuzzy does not mean that it is not important. So I think it's a promising uh, concept. And there's a trend in ecology towards quantitative ecology, but there's nothing wrong with it. We have new kinds of data, everybody's writing R scripts. But this session shows that working on concepts, on the conceptual framework is no less important, because that defines the kind of question we can ask, and that the kind of solutions we can get. And the second summary would be that it is possible to focus on mechanisms and detect mechanisms and ultimately perhaps use them to manage resilience of socio-ecological systems. Thanks everybody for coming and thanks to the speakers.